Well, I think I'm going to welcome everybody. We are here for our weekly webinar that we call Backstage. And this is a project of resilientchurchleadership.com. If you've not found us before, we encourage you to visit that site and get it on our mailing list so that you get these regular updates and uh, feedback from each weekly uh, webinar. And what we're doing, the reason we call it Backstage is we're exploring the really important relationship in leadership between who we are sort of on the front stage of our lives where the work gets done, the sermons get delivered, the vision gets cast, the public life is happening. That's the front stage. Uh, but most front stage environments have a backstage. And in theater, I suppose, in church and in life, really what happens backstage more than anything else is going to determine what's going on on the front stage. And yet the pressures of leadership often have us so focused on what's going on the front stage that we forget to make sure the backstage is in good shape. And then all kinds of difficult things can happen as a result. So we're welcoming you here today, really excited uh, for this weekly time for you to engage in something that we hope uh, is supportive to your own soul care and your own resilience in ministry and in leadership. So my name is Mindy Caliguire and I'm serving on the strategy group for this project. It's been a really fun journey that we've been on with several others who are part of this soul care conversation with leaders. Uh, I work on the senior leadership team in at GLU. I'm here in Boulder, Colorado, and uh, lead an organization about spiritual formation for leaders called Soul Care. But we're joined today by two um, two guests, which is awesome. You're going to get to meet them, but they are friends, which we love to highlight friendship and how that is a dimension of resiliency here. Um, so J.R. Briggs is joining us. He's an author. He's a pastor, ministry leader, does a lot of really cool things with coaching and a variety of things. So you're going to love hearing from him today. And also joining us is Andy Cook, who I consider a friend as well. And JR is a new friend, totally. but Andy and I are friends. <laughs> and um, he manages uh, this and many other initiatives uh, like it at the Wheaton College Billy Graham Center in Wheaton, Illinois. And these guys have been friends since college. So before we talk about today's topic, say a little bit about maybe tell us how did you guys first meet? How are you connected? And how are you still connected today? Yeah, so I'm honored uh, to have, I, I want to have as much time as possible for JR today because he's been speaking into my life and to the life of many leaders for years. Um, but we met at Taylor University um, and uh, had a just a great connection there. And then uh, JR has gone on to pastor in lots of different settings, which is one of the major reasons we wanted to have him today. He's uh, pastored in large churches, small churches, done church planting, um, worked with university students and seminaries and um, just think the world of him. He's written a bunch of different books uh, over the years and grateful to have his friendship and certainly have him on as part of the team today. Well, you're too kind, Andy. Thanks. It's good to see you again. <laughs> We're going to have a great chat today. Hey, before we get too far into this webcast, I want to let you know a couple opportunities. It'd be awesome if you want to like or share this out on your own feed so that we can maximize the number of leaders who you're probably connected to as well who might benefit from this, uh, either live or if you're listening to this sometime in the future, we'd love for you to um, help spread the word around that. And then um, we are also going to be monitoring the Facebook chat during this live portion. And Andy's going to be the one who's fielding questions, and then we'll bring them forward into our conversation today. And we would love to make this conversational and hear from you guys as well. The things we're talking about are some pretty important topics. And um, Andy promises that he did not have a double entendre for this particular <laughs> title for our talk today or for our conversation today. But here is our, here's our title to frame this conversation. Gearing up for an unpredictable fall, what you'll need to survive. No, he promises that he meant no, no double entendre on that, but it's not lost on all of us that uh, this is, I mean, again, the word unprecedented has been used an unprecedented number of times. It's just getting old, but uh, we don't know what we're heading into. And this is a particularly challenging time for leaders. I know like JR and Andy, I'm hearing of more and more levels of deep fatigue and exhaustion than, uh, than at any point really even besides that first acute three weeks when everyone was trying to figure out how to do the first digital Easter, then it sort of buoyed and we were about innovation and pivoting and all those things. And now I just feel like there's just deep exhaustion. So we really want to spend today's conversation and welcome your questions around what can you do now 
with so many things that are unknown and unpredictable, what things could you put in place now for yourself, for your team, for your loved ones to, to survive and more than survive, like to, to retain your resilience. And, uh, and so that's, that's our, our purpose for today and kind of the biggest reason why, why we're addressing this topic right now. So we know that soul care is one of the dimensions of resiliency. Um, JR, maybe say a little bit about what you're hearing from pastors in this moment and what, what gives you an indication that, that things are uh, in a particularly difficult way right now. Yeah, and like, like you, I've heard so many things. I, as I coach the pastors and the kingdom leaders that I work with around the country, they're all saying the same thing. They're crispy around the edges. They're exhausted because they don't know when this thing is going to end. It's one thing to say, I can push through a hard season for a few weeks or a few months or the next year is going to be tough. We, because we don't have an end line, that's where it's really difficult. Um, a lot of pastors are feeling shot at from both sides right now. They're finding themselves in a lot of lose-lose situations. And those can be really exhausting even more than just a typical intense situation. Let's not forget ministry was difficult even before the pandemic. So just right. add, it on, add it on top of this, of course. Right. Yeah, once you get past the adrenaline, now it's tedium and weariness that sets in. And so, you know, Barna just recently did a study that found that, that um, just in the past few months, only 3% of pastors found that they're doing a great job now in their role as pastor. And they also found that only 1% of pastors feel understood and I think that's real. That can be so draining when 99% of pastors feel misunderstood or not understood in their roles. That's why this topic is so crucial. And I am so grateful for resilient, uh, resilient church leadership and what you all are doing. Uh, mm -hmm. Andy and I had a phone conversation back in the spring, right after the pandemic hit and started. And I said, yeah, I've got a podcast called the resilient uh, leaders podcast. And he said, wait, what? <laughs> they said, we just started some of the resilient church leadership. I said, well, this is great. Let's let's work together. What can it look like to for a win win in this? So that's been really fun. And Mindy, I know this is your heart in this, that you cannot be resilient and unhealthy. Uh, <laughs> and so we've got to be healthy if we're going to be resilient and we've got to be resilient if we're going to be healthy. Um, there's that pliability. I think of that metaphor that Jesus uses um, where, you know, he talks about, you know, We've got to have pliable, you know, the wine and the wine skin. We've got to be pliable people. We've got to be flexible in that. That's just not structures. That's also who we are as individuals. And so that pliability and resiliency and adaptability goes hand in hand with health. And we've yeah. got to be healthy. Yeah, we've got yeah to be healthy. absolutely. And it really kind of hurts my heart a little bit to hear the thought of the lose-lose scenarios yeah. that many yeah. leaders are facing right now. Um, yeah, I can imagine on several fronts where that's the case. And so it, that is a particularly painful and isolating place. If 99% if of us are feeling not understood, yeah. uh, it draws us even further, or at least I guess we could see it as the invitation to draw us further into who am I before God? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. can I rest in my identity there, even yeah. when the world is on fire and everyone around me disagrees or is going to be upset with me no matter what I do. Like those yeah. are really hard and painful places to be. Um, but uh, yeah, those, those really strike me as being particularly challenging. So you're hearing this in your coaching practice. I know for me, I serve on the, uh, as a, a volunteer on the leadership team of my own church where uh, our team, and actually right now I've been in prayer and the others of us uh, on, who serve on this team uh, are been in prayer with them. They, they're away for a two day retreat right now. Mm -hmm. And I talked to, we have co-pastors and one of the pastors I've met with on Tuesday, I think. And uh, he validated what I, I told him we were gonna be having this conversation and some of the observations that we've been making. And he just said, it, it is particularly exhausting. Yeah. And hard to keep your own emotional energy up and then to try to bring that to buoy up the, the flagging energy of a team uh, has been challenging. And I, I have to say, you know, with all the decisions to make and what are we doing and when and how and what does the city think and all these things, which is where we're, we're at here in Colorado, mm -hmm. I'm so glad they're taking two days yeah. to, to just deal. That is and so wise. 
a theme that we uh, addressed on this webinar in with resilient church leaders many many months ago i think uh, but that i we talked about is grief and how in this two-day retreat how might it be important for you to just hold space to let the staff process how hard this is because we feel like we shouldn't say the hard thing we shouldn't say the negative thing we shouldn't say the i'm scared i'm angry i don't feel like doing this like those are hard things to say it's a work situation it's kingdom work like god's not giving up on you you can't give up on god i mean you can just imagine the rhetoric that would surround that even in our own heads um so I, I see the retreat as being uh, like a planned thing that something people can put into their calendar, whether it's just a personal retreat, getting some time away or as a team. How have you seen uh, leaders carve out time that is spent in ways that are restorative? What, what kinds of rhythms are you seeing that are helpful? Yeah, I've seen this with other pastors. I, I try to do this myself. I, I'm really encouraged by the pastors that do this where they say, I set a little bit of time every day, one day a week, and then one day a month where they actually, uh, they even tell their staff, we're going to pay for you, like your time, like it is a work day for you to get away, but you must leave your computer and your cell phone at home. It must not be on. You are being paid to blow off the day in the name of God. And I think that's a beautiful gift and a rhythm that's been built in, baked into the DNA and the culture of particular churches uh, and days away. Yeah, whether it's an annual retreat or a quarterly retreat. And they say, this is the worst time. And you go, that's exactly why you need it right now. That means yeah. it's the best time Such for us word. to spend some time away. So um, one of the joys of my life, and Andy knows this, um, I, before he passed away for 12 years, uh, Eugene Peterson was a mentor and a friend. And one of the things that he beat into my head that I'm so grateful <laughs> for is the importance of Sabbath, uh, not just as a good idea, but as an absolute requirement, if we're going to be in this for the long haul. And so I'm so grateful. He just said, I said, what do I do? You know, this is what I'm first, I'm a go-getter, I'm driven type A. And he said, just pray and play. I said, that's all I want you to do. Just pray and play. I'm like, what do I play? He said, I don't care. Just, just pray and play. <laughs> and I'm so grateful that he just beat that into my head. And, um, and that's been so important. I have never met a, a burned out pastor who practiced sabbath regularly oh. and now i'm sure they're out there but i've interacted with a lot of pastors i've never met a burned out pastor who took sabbath very seriously and uh, i when when pastors are burned out i simply say to them uh tell me about your sabbath your weekly sabbath and they say i didn't have one and i say i know i know i'm not saying that's the that's going to be the be all end all that keeps you from burnout but I know that of all the times where we say, I can't afford the time to do this is exactly the time that we need it. So um, the time I have to trust Jesus the most is during Sabbath, not the other six days of the week. It's trusting and releasing back to God. This is his day. This is his world. The church, lowercase c and capital C, will not fall apart if I take one day off. And the arrogance, I have to catch myself to think, oh, but this will fall apart if I'm not here, God. Really? Wow. So it's, it's a pruning time for me when I practice Sabbath. And that goes along with rest. The world just needs more well-rested leaders. I think we'd all agree with that before the pandemic. And so replenishment, we all need ways in which we need to replenish. And God has made us unique in each in, in different ways. And so we need to have permission, permission to rest. I, I just wish I could look every pastor in the eye and say, you, you have absolute permission to rest. But I would say put it in your job description. Uh, I would tell our elders, you need to hold me to the fact that I need to rest. And if I'm working too hard, you need to remind me I'm not doing my job. And uh, they've been really good at that uh, over the years. But we all need replenishment. We have replenishment cycles. And so when I work with leaders, I say, what's your replenishment plan in the physical, the emotional, the mental and the, the spiritual? And I actually have them diagram that. I want you to write in those four categories. What replenishes you now? Some people would say working out. Some people say, I don't want to work out. That didn't replenish me. I want to go work in the yard. Other people say, I don't want to work in the yard. I hate working, doing yard work. <laughs> so it's unique for everybody. But I think that's really important when we're depleted, and we are, and we will be. Can we see our depletion and our limitations not as a curse, but as a blessing and an invitation for, I love that phrase, Mindy, holding space 
for Jesus to come and fill us up through his spirit. So rest is a huge one. Uh, journaling is a huge one for me. Um, not everyone journals. Jesus didn't journal. It's okay if you you don't journal. Uh, but for me, that's he actually wrote, wrote the Psalms or not. So, so yeah, know. there you go. There you go. <laughs> and then, uh, but I, I think too, you know, cultivating the gift of friendship, which is easy to say, but I know pastors struggle. They're the, some of the most isolated people on the planet. And so sometimes that, that could be a, a friend, a, a counselor, a mentor, a coach, a spouse, but someone other than yourself so we can get out of our heads. Um, yeah. And we've, we, if we just live in our heads, we just miss so much. And I think sometimes the evil one is so good at uh, telling us lies, uh, actually telling us truth plus or minus 10%. I think he knows we're too smart to believe outlandish lies. So he tells us 90% of the truth, and then he just perverts and bends it just enough that it's a poisoned lie. And so I think we need people outside of ourselves reminding us, hey, this part is correct, but you are missing this. And I think that's the gift that we can have of other people around us speaking into our lives with the truth of, of Christ. Well, and JR, I know you've done that for me at different points. One of the questions, and you're great at some of the individual practices. Tell us a little bit about if you were leading a uh, retreat with a team, right now i mean we're trying yeah. to gear people up for i mean you're standing there as a leader vision wise you're trying to go i don't know what the next month looks like i don't know what the next two months looks like i don't know if we're open closed going back and forth there's so much unknown what's important to help our um, teams gear up for the fall yeah yeah it's a great question i think the right word is preparation i think we so focus on plans but preparation is more important than planning. And uh, my favorite sports quote of all time, Mike Tyson said, everybody has a plan until you get punched in the face. And uh, <laughs> we've all stuck our chin out and 2020 has just hit us right across the face this year. And so resiliency, I think, is the ability to be open with preparedness. That's not a lack of faith. I mean, I think of, I think of Nehemiah, right? He's rebuilding the wall. It said he strapped a sword to his hip and prayed to the God, uh, uh, the God of the Israel. I mean, there's prayer and faith, and there's also our own preparation. And so, um, yeah, so I think just being willing to, to acknowledge that preparation is more important than planning to start. The second thing is, I'm trying to teach leaders this great little phrase. It's okay to stand in front of your people and say, I don't know. I don't know. But I commit to working with you to figuring this out together. And so I think when we, we, we need to be calm, right? Calm is contagious. But if all we try to do is project like the strong one, the brilliant one up on stage with all the answers, it not only is inaccurate, it's setting us up for more pressure and exhaustion down the road. But on top of that, it's giving a false impression to our people that our leader knows something we don't. Why is he or she not sharing that with me? I think the human side of this is to say, I don't know, but I commit to journeying with you. I'm not giving up on you. We're going to pursue this. We're going to press in with the Lord. But I don't know. Let's figure this out together. And I think there's just such freedom in being able to say, I don't know. Um, and naming things just has a way of taming things. And so uh, even though people want certainty, to tell people we have certainty when we don't is not only a lie. It actually reduces trust that people might have in us or in the church. Um, and I would just encourage people as much as you can develop some sort of rule of life, it doesn't have to be an official capital R rule of life, but some sort of rhythm that not only you can develop and you have to submit it to someone else because we can rationalize, oh yeah, I'll get around to it tomorrow or next week. Oh, maybe I'll just put that on the shelf for the next season. I think in a grace-filled way, if we can invite other people into that process to say, you have a backstage pass to my life, you can ask me any question you want, and I want to submit my plan to you. And I don't mean a 10 page report. It could be an index card. But here in this next season are the practices that I know are unique to me that are going to help. And then even submitting that to the team, it, even just standing up and saying, you don't have to give your whole list. But as we are together in a meeting, would you be willing to share one thing on the list that by God's grace you want to commit to of pursuing together? Then it's not an accountability of like a wrist slap, but more of a, hey, good job. I know you've been cultivating that. Or how's that going? How can I encourage you to press in in this next season in that area that you mentioned? 
in our meeting last week. So there are many more, but I think those are a few that, that come to mind. Yeah, uh, and you a really use good a, a phrase that I love, uh, rule of life. Um, mm -hmm. But just on the odd chance that maybe some of our listeners are not familiar with that phrase, you sort of defined it as you went along. But why don't you pause and give us a little bit of a context on what do you mean by rule of life and how yeah. that find expression for an individual and a team? Yeah, great. And I certainly would love for you to uh, jump in here and answer that as, too, as well, uh, Mindy, because I know this is a passion of yours. But uh, what are the the lattice work what's the scaffolding in our own lives right if we want growth to happen in our in our backyard here we've got a, a clematis bush that is beautiful every summer but it needs the lattice work to be able to structure it and so uh, the rule of life is not an oppressive wall that keeps growth down but it's just enough structure that allow rhythms to occur that are grace-filled that allow the growth of the clematis to walk to go up the wall and uh, in many ways, that's how I envision uh, what a rule of life is. Some of that is daily, some of that is weekly, some monthly, some quarterly, and some yearly for me. Um, and they're always grace-filled. I always want it to be stretched but not stressed when it comes to my rule of life. And when I start to feel that I'm being stressed about it, it's either legalism or I'm just not extending grace to myself the way God extends it to me. I'm just realizing this is a goofy season. This is a hard season. Um, but lattice work is kind of the image that comes to my mind. So yeah. how would you, how would you describe that, Mindy? What does that yeah. look well, like for I, you? I can tell a little bit of a story. So, um, and Andy may remember this. I, when I first joined the staff of the Willow Creek Association um, back in 2009, I had been in a women's small group for a number of years that had been extremely important to my soul health, right? To your point, friendship is a key dimension of how God breathes life into us and helps us journey into this path of, of kingdom life and transformation, all that good stuff. So that had been a huge part of my life, but I knew my schedule was about to go on tilt. My kids were relatively young and I knew I needed a new rhythm of relationships. So of course those friendships remained intact, but I needed to say like, I can't commit to that with travel and everything else, but uh, I knew I needed to find another relational dimension that would still be helping me stay, which is kind of an indicator of rules. So rule of like, I must have somebody who knows me well enough to know what's going on in my life and help me with that. Right. So that was a, that was one signal about how I think about this, but the truth was I, um, so I enlisted the services of a spiritual director down in the Wheaton area. Um, she's delightful. Many other people that I know and respect and love had, had uh, begun, been clients of hers. And so we had begun journeying together several months maybe into our relationship. And she suggested that I explore this idea of a rule of life. She said, do you have a rule of life? And I said, well, I've never really formalized anything. I usually think about it as a way of life, but um, you know, anyway, I went into this process of trying to, she said, why don't you try to explore that? And, uh, and the Latin term regula that you're referring to is the derivation of the word rule is this idea of regula. It's a trellis, a structure, exactly what you're talking about that allows for optimal fruit bearing or flowering as you like with the clematis, you know, it's like strawberries or tomatoes that just run around the floor on the ground are not going to be optimal unless they have something to climb on. Right. So it's a really powerful spiritual metaphor. So she told me all about that and the Benedictine rule. And I, you know, went and learned more about it. Uh, and so I set out to have, you know, a structure and my conclusion after a month, I went back to her was like, I, I cannot, I have no rule of life. I have the most, the only thing I've discovered through this month of effort is that I have the most unruly life in the world. <laughs> And so I ended up thinking about it, about how do, how do leaders, what is a rule of life for the unruly life of a leader? Most of our lives are very unruly. Like at 6.30 in the morning, especially in that season of my life, like sometimes I was sitting having a quiet moment with scripture or prayer and my steaming cup of coffee that people write about in books. But like sometimes I'm leading a meeting, sometimes I'm taking off on a plane, sometimes I'm landing at 630 in the morning, sometimes I am, you know, taking the kids to school, sometimes I'm taking their backpack to school because they forgot it. I, I mean, it was like, 
I'm making lunches and one of the 20 things that I might do at 6.30 in the morning on any given day was sit quietly with the Lord. One. And there was no way I could find to anchor in a traditional sense what I thought a rule of life needed to be. And I went back to her office and I felt like a complete failure and a complete fraud. Like how can a spiritual formation person not have a neat and tidy rule of life? <laughs> and she kind of talked me off my ledge of shame and, uh, and helped me identify that there were things in my life that are pillars of, of resolute um, dependency on God and mechanisms to move into those spaces but most of them don't live in a timed schedule. Even Sabbath for me is not a like same time, same bat channel every week. That has never worked for me. But I can't get away from the principle and the deep need for rest, especially as, you, as you've described it so beautifully. Um, I, I need that. But I, I had to invent what I call like a 24 hour floating Sabbath that mm over the course of usually Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, somewhere in the general vicinity of what we would think of as weekend, yeah. I, I sort of draw a mental line in my calendar where appropriate, given elder meetings, work meetings, whatever, between all those things, when, when have I crossed a threshold of, I'm not pushing right now. Mm -hmm. I'm not driving anything. I like your two words. I'm going to rest and pray. Was that it? Pray and play. Pray and play. Yeah. Pray and play. <laughs> yeah. And um, and that has been helpful for me as a way to bring the principle of rest and play and prayer and not striving. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, into my weekly rhythm without the rule of it having, having to hit my schedule in a certain way. So anyway, that yeah, might be yeah. my, but. No, I, I'm really glad you're bringing that up, uh, Mindy. I think that's really important. Thank you for sharing where that's regular and where we get rule, because I think when people hear rule, they're like, oh my gosh, more legalism. And I'm worth like, no, right. no, 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 this is as grace-filled as it gets. Yep. Yeah, it's that lattice work, that regular, yep. where we get the word regular, right? That there's a pattern to how, so some people, if the R word is too, difficult they use the pattern of life as a way of talking about it just to remind them that it's a grace-filled exercise uh, that's there to help them yeah not to for me fun. for me the intensity with which i hold to what i call a way of life um even though it doesn't fit a a, a, a calendared pattern the same way that i my head says a rule of life should um actually came I'll tell another little bit when I was in Boston we were church planting in Boston and the women in my small group some of them were deeply involved in 12-step recovery programs mm -hmm. I learned from them a whole different understanding of grace mm -hmm. of the role of relationships in our journey and what I found out was there were like 12 step groups that were like the big meetings where you would go if you were considering to give up whatever your thing was, drug of choice, so to speak. And you would listen to people's stories, kind of like the church ought to be, right? Like, and hear how someone experienced recovery and, and, and found God in that or whatever in that, in that context depends on how God focused the group is. But if you really wanted to then work the steps and they would sometimes call them step groups. And it was a committed group. Like you couldn't miss more than two. And you had to go through the actual 12 steps with this group of people and your sponsor. They had a different name for those groups. And they called them AWOL groups. And it stood for a way of life. Wow. And for me, that's how I think of a rule of life in my life. It's, it's a way of life. It doesn't sit very neatly into time slots for me, but mm -hmm. it is a way of life that I am absolutely dependent upon. And it has that cool, like no disrespect to the military. It has a kind of a cool double entendre with, I've gone AWOL mm -hmm. from the systems of this world in terms of where I derive my life, my value, my energy, my vision. Mm -hmm. And we almost need that kind of a 
feisty like refusal and frankly sometimes we have to be refusing the sort of church machinery and ministry machinery to move into something that will restore our lives that will become yeah. a way of life and so that's that's you said a pattern of life i know i don't handy how have you have you done much with this idea of a spiritual practice around a rule of life or way of life yeah and and i'm also conscious of there's a bunch of pastors out there who they had a rule of life and it all yeah. um, got very disrupted in March. And so part of me is like asking the question, I mean, cause there were pastors who they would spend, they had pretty good rhythms, um, either days off kind of intermixed there, but a lot centered around the message and the communication of God's word in a Sunday morning format. And so they're finding themselves in a COVID environment where they've already recorded their message or yeah. they're trying to figure out. So JR, like I know a bunch of this has been mixed up by COVID, right? So yeah. what does it mean to actually do a, a rule of life or pattern of life or rule like in the midst of this season as we're trying to help our teams and ourselves gear up for this fall? Yeah, it's a great question. When I'm working with leaders, uh, I refuse to use the phrase, the new normal. I have rejected that phrase since the first okay. week that people started using it. Instead, it is the new reality. And I even, even press into that. I think the new normal is sort of, let's snap back to what we knew. And, and it's sort of backward focus. And I think new reality is present and future focus, which is why I'm using that so adamantly in these days ahead. But um, but even from that, I encourage leaders to think through what I call the now reality, the next reality, and the new reality. And if we can almost have trifocals to almost see, you know, if you've got trifocals, you're kind of looking, you're tilting your head to see, you know, near, far, and in between. And so, you know, in a now reality, that's like, what do I need today to be healthy? What do I need the rest of this week to the weekend in order to be healthy and faithful? And so what do I need on just those three minutes or five minutes on a daily basis. And then the, ne the next reality is more of like the next few weeks, right? We know that this is launching in the next few weeks. And so this is going to be a push for us. And so what's needed in these few weeks or a, a month or two. And then, the, and then the new reality is where we plan more for the long haul. And so we treat this like we've used the metaphor more like a marathon than a sprint. And so, um, you know, I, I think those three things have been helpful and I actually have different categories in my pattern or my rule of life of the now reality, the next reality and the new reality. Um, you know, sprinting, uh, fifth, you know, maybe a 5K and then kind of a half marathon kind of, I'm not a runner, I run, but I'm not a runner. Uh, so I think I would use it in those three buckets. If you can just look out of your trifocals and just kind of tilt your head, I think that can help to just put different things in perspective also giving yourself permission, right? The spirit is asking us to be pliable, just like the wineskin in this season. You may get through an, the next reality over the next six weeks and say, this pattern needs to change. I'm really sensing the Lord is freeing me from this. And maybe this is an opportunity for me to latch on to this or to let go of this. Um, I think we patterns are good, but sometimes if we're too stringent about them, um, they can easily turn into a rut or even worse, maybe even legalism and deep exhaustion that's not intended. So, yeah, JR, when you think about uh, the different practices that might have uh, th that are not serving us in this day, what what indicators like how would you help somebody know if the thing that helped them last week isn't helping them this week? Yeah, it's a great question. I think the big one is resentment. <laughs> when there's a resentment that grows in me of what's something that's supposed to give me life and joy and health, and I'm going, oh, I have to do this. I can't believe. Like if I, if I find myself gritting my literal or metaphorical teeth, uh, then I say, whoa, whoa, these are supposed to be life-giving practices for me. Um, so that's the first one. The other thing is inviting other people. If I submit it to other people, I'm also saying to them, are you seeing health and growth out of this and sort of mm -hmm. the backside of resentment? Are you seeing uh, ever increasing joy in my life, right? The evidence, the fruit of the spirit in my life is that I'm exhibiting joy. Is there joy and a lightness? Uh, not, not a, it's not a flippancy, but just a lightness and a joy, even in a heavy season. I think those are some indicators, but the first, the big one for me is resentment. resentment. No, that's great. I love that. They, and back to the 12 step thing. I've heard that all it takes to get this 12 step group is, started is a, is a resentment and a pot of coffee. <laughs> so uh, I don't know, it's just random uh, memory that came to mind. Okay. I'm listening to you right now on Facebook or some point in the future. And I'm thinking, I cannot remember the last time I felt joy. 
what do you say? Yeah, that's a great that question. Matter. That is a great question. Um, I, there have been many seasons where I'm in that. I think if you ask my wife that she would say, yep, that's JR too. So I, I would put myself in a category where joy doesn't come easily to me. And, uh, uh, joy is infectious, so it's really important for me to be around people who exude joy. I actually have a small list of people who, when I think of their life, no matter what's going on, they have authentic joy. And so sometimes just the phone call, can I, hey, can I just have a quick Zoom call with you? I just want some of that joy to rub off on me. Uh, it's not it's not a gimmick, but I just feel like there's, you know, joy is contagious. And so I need to be around that. Number two, it's prayer. I mean, the, the joy of your salvation, Lord, would you return that to me? And so I just need to ask and invite other people, uh, to, you know, will you help me experience joy, Lord? The third thing is, and Mindy, you may know him. Um, I Jim think he's Heather. in Broomfield. Uh, well, actually, uh, Steve Cuss. Uh, oh, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so Steve has been on our podcast before and, and we, we talked to him. He talks about a life-giving list that he has on his phone and those things that have just we feel like they're quote unquote unspiritual things, but they're very spiritual because God has uniquely wired us in our emotions and our bodies. And so he just has a list on there of things that give him great joy and give him life. And sometimes there are things that he said will never happen again. Go to the Great Wall of China brought him great joy. Probably won't happen again in his life, he said. But he loves throwing the ball, the tennis ball with his dog in the backyard. That's something he can step away from his desk and take a five minute break and do. And so for us, we've developed our life-giving list. And so for me, I've got to be on the water or in the water. I love my canoe. I love being in a kayak. Uh, you know, we're, we're an hour and a half away from the Jersey Shore. So sticking our feet in the Atlantic or in the sand is really important. And so being in or on the water this summer has been really important for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, almost weekly, I've carved out time, which is not like me to be able to just be in or on the water by myself or with others. And I just go, oh, Lord, it's going to be okay. Like there's just something restorative in me that brings me joy. Other people it may not be canoeing or kayaking or being in the ocean, but whatever it is, I think we can develop our own life giving list, have it on our phone or in an, on an index card or a sticky note. And then refer back to that regularly to say, Lord, I believe that you've wired me in certain ways. You've given me opportunity and access to some of these opportunities that are five minutes and free or maybe more long-term and a multi-day or financial investment, I think we need to lean into life-giving lists right now. In this I love season. that. So, I love you know. that. That's something anybody who's listening, you can do that. You can write yeah. a life-giving list if you don't have one already. And I also love the speed dial to the people who give you joy. Um, I, I thought you were going to mention Jim Wilder. I've been really following a lot of his work. Uh, he recently moved to Evergreen, Colorado. So I've gotten to know him personally. And he really sits at that intersection between spiritual formation, neuroscience, and then some around the counseling therapy recovery world. And so he has a very interesting point of view. But his, his teaching has helped me understand more about how joy specifically is an inherently relational construct in the brain mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's no surprise to hear that you would say you have a list of people that you connect with because what what registers in our brain as joy and this might be an interesting exercise for for everyone to go through is what registers on your brain as joy is when you see someone whose face lights up when they see you mm -hmm. So the part of your brain that registers joy is when someone is delighted to see you. And so when you have that list of people who, even if they're only on the phone, you can tell they're delighted to hear from you. Yeah. Even through their yeah. text, you can tell they were delighted. That is not that you wouldn't want to bring that to them as well, but it's a way that you are bringing literally to your brain, firing the parts of your brain that register joy. And it was interesting to me that you also said friends, and then you said prayer mm -hmm. and allowing God to restore the joy of our salvation. Mm -hmm. Prayer in Wilder's way of describing it and particular ways of prayer, which maybe Andy, we can talk about in a future <laughs> session. Really? It's really good stuff. But it's like when we rest ourselves in God's care, what do we know about God's face towards us when we come to him? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. God is the one who ultimately mm -hmm registers joy at our at our presence and we're joyful yeah. in his presence but for us to know that his face shines upon us mm 
Yes, right. I was just going to say that, Mindy. Like right. that's the say ironic that blessing, blessing, right? Yes, say the that ironic blessing. blessing. Well, pe- people people don't know this, but that's one of the oldest passages that's they believe has ever been written. And the yep. idea of God's face shining upon us, one of the questions I use when I'm working with leaders is, clo- I say, close your eyes, and I want you to envision God looking at you or thinking of you. What is the look on his face? Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, the answer oftentimes is disappointment, distance, apathy. And I go, no, 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 no. We're told that his face shines. Yeah. Apathy doesn't shine. Right. Disappointment doesn't shine. Joy shines. I said, yeah. when your father in heaven sees you, yes. his face shines. It lights up. Yeah. And so just that reminder to always keep that yeah. in front of us in this yeah. season is very yeah. important. And something that Lacey Borgo, who works with Renovare, yeah, that she we... said to us, Lacey said, she said, be as gracious and as patient with yourself as God is with you. And she said that maybe a year ago, but that's something I'm finding, not just reminding leaders. I'm having to say that to myself about once a week in this season, especially as an Enneagram one. That's really important for me that I <laughs> am as gracious and as patient with myself as God is with me because his face is shining. It shining, shining, with joy. shining. It was the oh, joy before definitely. him that he endured the cross. I mean, this yeah. is this is a really big idea. So yeah. um, I know we wanted to make sure to give some folks some time to think about a couple journaling exercises that might be valuable for themselves and then that they could turn around and perhaps offer to their teams if if uh, if that seemed appropriate. So you know, JR, I'd love to just turn it over to you. And usually on these webinars, we like to have some sort of experiential time for you, uh, for listeners and uh, those who are joining us. So I really kind of want to just turn it over to you for this next few minutes and sort of see how you might guide us uh, through some reflection that would be helpful to us in this season as we think about how we're preparing for this unpredictable fall. Sure. Yeah. Thanks for that opportunity. I I think, yeah. And I want to encourage you again, if you're not a journaler, but you have a piece of paper handy, even if it's a scratch sheet of paper, just grab that right now. Mm. And I'm a big fan of analog. Like I'm I'm on digital all day. And so like, I'm just a big fan of like pen and paper. And so if you have that nearby, I want to encourage you to do that. If not, you can do it in your head and that's fine. But um, I think one of the things before um, I get into a specific uh, kind of tool or framework is I like to just ask a few questions of like, what are the three dominating emotions that you're feeling right now? Mm-hmm. That sometimes we forget that we're, we as pastors and leaders are allowed to feel. <laughs> and so sometimes I put up, it's an emotion wheel, like a feeling, mm-hmm. feeling words wheel. And I'll simply ask leaders, see if you can identify one or two or three of the most dominating emotions you feel today, this week, in this season. Um, and then also then once they've identified that to simply ask, Lord, what might this reveal about what you want to do in me or work or change in me or affirm in me? And so uh, that's a big one. I think in resiliency, when we talk about this um, as well, is there's a sense of agency when it comes to resiliency. And so sometimes it's just good to ask people to pull out a piece of paper with a line straight down the middle and on the left to say what's in my control and on the right, what's not in my control. Because what I've found is I spend so much time and energy focusing on the things that are not in my control, worry, then I become so exhausted that I have no energy left in the tank to focus and steward what God has entrusted for me to do what's in my control. So it's a double whammy. And so it's a spiritual practice for me to say, Lord, this is what's not in my control in this season. I can't control what the CDC says. I can't control what the governor says. I can't control the virus. I can't control how people vote. I can't control whatever it may be. And so, Lord, my hands are up, palms up. I release that to you. But now that I've released this to you, you have also entrusted some things to me right now that I need to steward. And so, Lord, would you give me wisdom, courage, and compassion to steward what's been entrusted to me in this season? And I think that just that simple practice in my control, not in my control, is such a simple resiliency tool that we we all can use that can actually become a beautiful spiritual formation uh, tool as well. Um, This is one I'd submit to teams to do as well, uh, more in discussion. My family and I, we did this every night at dinner for the first few months, and we got this from uh, Jared Mackey, a friend of mine at the Sacred Grace uh, Network of Churches in Denver, Colorado. Um, We just call them the big three. 
And we're not asking them as frequently now, but we, for a few months, we're asking them every night at dinner, what has the reality of the virus taken away from me today? So there's a sense of lament. And so sometimes it's like, my kids are like, I was supposed to go on a field trip this week that I was really looking forward to, or I really miss my friends at school, or, you know, I've lost my job or, you know, I grandma got the virus or whatever. What is it taken away? Number one, number two, what is the reality of the virus not taken away from me? Cause there's a lot that's taken away, but there's still a lot that still remains. And so there's a sense of awareness of what still, still is. And the third thing is what is the reality of the virus given to me that if we're looking for it, there are actually some blessings. And I mean, a lot of us are saying, I like being home and not being so busy. I like our family has spent a lot of time and made memories together. We wouldn't have had, had the virus not occurred. So there's lament. What is it taken away from me? There is awareness. What is it not taken away? And then what is it given to me is, is a, a sign of gratitude. And I think all three of those, the same three questions every night, our family, we have such I different love discussions. That. Every I'm totally stealing night. that. Steal it. It's not I mean, mine. I'm not Jared stealing Michael. it. I'll so. give attribution, but we are totally going to do that. <laughs> yeah. And, and you can do that with your family. You can do that yourself right. in general. You can do that as a team. But I think that would be a good tool that the team, you know, Andy, you talked about the question, what do we do with the team? How do we get ready for the fall? I think just naming where people are at before we get to what are we going to do for the fall? Who are we going into the fall? Yeah. <laughs> and let's start there is the first thing. So oh, I want to show you, and I think I have... Um, screen share uh, capabilities here. I think you all can see that here. But this, this has been a beautiful thing that we've used uh, with leaders. And just we call the inner compass. And so if you just think about a compass rose and um, of just allowing people a chance to reflect on this. And if it's all right, uh, Andy and Mindy, what I'd love to be able to do is just give about 30 seconds of silence to just pause and allow us to think about this. So I want you to think about your North Star, your guiding light. As a pastor, I'm going to assume that Christ is your guiding light in this. And so if Christ is our North Star, I want to just ask you to reflect. You can journal it now if you want. You can reflect on it silently. But where does my faith in Christ need to deepen? Who loves me deeply and who guides me in this season? Now, this can also include Christ. I mean, it's Christ, but it also can include other people. Who are the voices I listen to? Who are the mentors, the wise people, um, those who are supporting me in this season? So just take a moment to think through where does my faith need to deepen? Who loves me and who guides me in this season? And then as you think about uh, the sun rising from the east, what or who do I need to welcome? What do I need to take hold of? What are the new possibilities, the new opportunities, the new areas of joy, maybe even challenge that I need to take hold of that are right in front of me that I need to welcome? And instead of resisting, I need to have my hands open to receive. So who or what are those in your life? What do you need to take hold of and steward what God is giving to you in this moment? Take a moment. Uh, to jot those down or to pray through that. And then your Southern light, that's sort of our deep seated emotions uh, inside of us. So what do I long to do? Or more importantly, what do I long to become in this season? Who do I long to become? What do I sense Jesus is inviting me in, in my own formation and my own character? And then where do I currently experience joy and delight? Or as we were talking about just a moment ago, where do I need to experience joy and delight? Maybe even an additional one, who could help me cultivate joy and delight in this season? So take a moment to think through what do you long to do or become and where is your joy and delight in this season?
And then lastly, thinking West Coast here, the setting sun out in California as the sun sets. So what do you need to let go of or to release? Um, where do you need healing? As far as release, this could be a relationship that was close to you that's no longer there, a hurt, a grudge. Uh, maybe you're grieving something and you just need to say, I need to grieve it, but eventually I need to just let go of it. Or a dream that you might have had, a disappointment. So take a moment to think through what is setting that we need to just make amends and we need to just release to the Lord now as the sun is setting. Amen. And so I just, I think this can be a wonderful practice that we do by ourselves or maybe even with the team. I've worked with teams where we've actually done this for an entire morning and mm -hmm. we actually spent about 30 to 45 minutes in each one of these directions on the compass rose. So um, anyway, yeah, yeah I think great. that's a practice. I hope ago. everyone will take us up on that. And Gang, just so you know, we uh, are providing like a weekly email that follows each one of these webinars. And with that email will be some notes and a, possibly a download that would be a resource you can use for your own reflection and, uh, and in the future with your team. So uh, make sure you go to resilientchurchleaders.com and sign up for that uh, email because you're going to want uh, to have that resource to be able to look back on. I'm guaranteeing it. Maybe people are taking screenshots. I don't know. They're probably pretty techie out there but uh jr that was really gr great i know that was a helpful thing even for me now just listening to you and having that space to answer some of those questions prayerfully so really really grateful for that i know one of the things that you're really passionate about and you've even got a book coming up about this is kind of how we navigate the the edges on a topic that might be polarizing and things yeah. that seem so far apart um, wonder if you have a point of view, like what are some of the biggest tensions that we're heading into in the next few weeks and maybe some words I know I heard I heard it was kind of code now I know you well enough to know you you dropped those three words in there earlier. <laughs> but what where where are some tensions and how can you maybe get, leave us with a, a thought or two about how to navigate those as we head into the next few weeks. Yeah, yeah, there certainly are so many tensions. Some of them are conflict tensions and some of them are more rubber band tensions. You know, of course, if we don't use a rubber band, what's the point? If we pull it too far, of course, break. So how do we know what that healthy tension looks like and what we're doing? The tensions from like, do we wear a mask or not? Do we open or not? You know, who do we vote for, blue or red? I mean, it's, it's just a pressure cooker time and the polarization is ever increasing. The opinions on social media are becoming nastier. And so it's what does it look like in this polarized world? I, there have been times I've said, there's got to be a better way. There's got to be a better way than the way in which this polarization is happening. So I think we the first thing we just need to name those. And, um, you know, most of leadership, as Andy Stanley said, is not about problems to be solved, but about tensions to be managed. And mm -hmm. that's been a great thing that has served me well over the years when I first heard that. So. Um, and I think we need to just acknowledge they're everywhere. They are a part of ministry. We cannot avoid them. So we can either see them with disgust or we can invite them as a friend who can teach us something in this moment. I think the temptation is if we only stick to the, the surface of what is the actual tension, we don't get anywhere. But if we can go below the surface and say, what is really behind this? Why am I trying to be so defensive? What am I trying to protect here? Yep. What is it Jesus might want to say to us in this moment, um, I think can really drill down. It's scary because that's where the ugliness can come out. That's where the motivation, the fear, the arrogance can come out. But if we just stay on the surface, I really think the evil one wins. That's where we have to drill down to say, whoa, what's behind this? Why am I living like this instead of like this? Wow. Um, and so the other thing is we just need to realize we just can't please everybody. I mean, leadership oftentimes is an intentional decision of choosing whom we're going to disappoint. And so I am struck by the fact that Jesus was willing to disappoint every single person except his father. I mean, let that sink in for those of us who are people pleasers. That's 
Eesh, that's a little too close to home. But if that was <laughs> Jesus's, if that was Jesus's position, that should prompt some serious reflection on our part. Mm-hmm. And so there's a great deal of tensions in Scripture. And again, I'm not necessarily talking tensions, but rubber band tensions. I mean, nothing has messed with my theology more than reading my Bible. And when I see Jesus and I see so many of the ways that he had and lived into these healthy tensions, he lived this sacred overlap where it's not one or the other. It was a lot of both ends that exist, which kind of make me a little nervous, right? What do you mean both and? You know, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He is. But once we follow the great either or, Jesus himself, there's a whole world of discipleship that's about both and, uh, the and also. So he's fully God and fully man. He's the lion and the lamb, the alpha and the omega. There's a tenderness and there's there's a firmness to him. There's grace and also truth, right? Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Give to God what is God's. He enters Jericho and helps the oppressed, blind Bartimaeus. He also helps the oppressor in Zacchaeus, all in the same city. And so there's this healthy, tension-filled life that Jesus lives. And if we're followers of Jesus, he's saying, come join me in that sacred overlap, uh, you know, kind of a Venn diagram. I want you to live in the middle here. Oh, and come on. You've got to show get... everybody your level of commitment to Venn diagrams. All right. All right. I, I'm a little bit nerdy about this. I do love Venn diagrams, maybe a little too much, but I, I do have a tattoo <laughs> of it. And uh, uh, so Andy's shaking his I love head. it, but gonna, you have three get his there. Soon. <laughs> you yes, have three yes. there and and yep. give us those your prayer of 2020 i, I it yes. stuck with me so long after we talked uh, earlier this week mm-hmm. i think that would be a great sort of parting thing before we really wrap up what is your tw- prayer of 2020 that you told me yeah well yeah well certainly the start is you know this idea of when i brush my teeth is the father son and spirit of course lord help me live into the triune god the triune nature of who you are today all three members of the Trinity are fully available to me and accessible and walking with me today. And Lord, I want to steward that well. But once that sort of Trinitarian prayer is prayed, I pray, I pray these three things. Lord, would you give me wisdom? Would you give me courage? And would you give me compassion? Because wisdom and courage without compassion can be really careless. And, and courage and compassion without wisdom is really reckless. And wisdom and compassion without courage is really really riskless. But when we have all three, wisdom, courage, and compassion together, that's priceless. And I think in this season moving forward, the best thing that kingdom leaders can do is to pray every day in that Trinitarian God uh, to be with us, that he would grant us wisdom, courage, and compassion. Mm -hmm. All three are needed. And God has a penchant to use leaders who are those three things. Amen. Well, Godspeed to your work, man. JR, it's really been fun getting to know you more, uh, more personally than just at a distance. Um, again, we want to make sure to highlight uh, JR's book is called Sacred Overlap. And so you'll learn more about those key ideas uh, through that. And that'll also be in our newsletter coming up. And again, just want to thank you for joining us. We really are committed to walking alongside leaders week over week with ways to care for your soul, ways to tend to the backstage. We really believe in the important work you're bringing forward on the front stage and we're here to support you. So continue to go to resilientchurchleaders.com and sign up for our email and we'll look forward to being with you next week. Take care.